The Spartans feared that when their officers went overseas, they would become corrupted, as they had seen in the case of Pausanias, and at the same time, they no longer wanted to be burdened with the war against Persia. Thucydides Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, episode 51, Cracks Appear. Well, here we are. We are now into the new phase in the series. We will be picking up events where we left them after the Greek victory over the Persians in 479 BC. This will see us focusing back on events over in the Eastern Aegean during the very next year. To the Greeks, this was just a continuation of unfolding events in the wake of their victories over the Persian Empire. For us though, from this historical perspective, it marks a point where the situation amongst the Greeks begin to change and would lead down a path to war that would inflict even greater suffering on the Greek world. We just need to not lose sight of the fact that history is a continuous series of unfolding events. It is only hindsight that allows us to place our historical markers. In this episode, we have placed our historical marker indicating a new phase in the historical record at the defeat of the Second Persian Invasion. This is a point where many also officially see the Greek world transitioning from the Archaic Age into the Classical Age. To mark this point, I had wandered off on a slight digression to fill some gaps around the edges of the narrative of the Greek world. This saw us looking at the history and development of regions on the Greek periphery up to the end of the Archaic period. I must admit I spent longer on this digression than first intended, though I feel if I had not spent the episodes that we did, this look at the periphery would have been lacking. All of these regions will come into the narrative in more direct ways as we advance through the Classical Age, so hopefully the time we spent with them so far has developed a good amount of context as we encounter them in the future. Another reason this marks a new phase in the series is due to the fact that we will be saying goodbye to our foundational ancient source of Herodotus and welcoming in a new source to build a foundation around, Thucydides. I feel we marked this transition well with the episodes we spent looking at Herodotus as a historian and investigating the different areas around his work once we reached the end of the subject matter. While with just last episode we marked our transition to Thucydides with an introduction to him and his work on the Peloponnesian War thanks to Professor James Rolm. This, I feel, now puts us in an excellent position to continue the narrative into the new phase, though first let's quickly summarise the events around 479 BC before we then continue into the year of 478 that would see this new period of Greek history develop. In the year 479 BC, the battles of Plataea and Mycale would take place. Plataea would see the final defeat of the Persian forces in Greek lands, while Mycale, supposedly fought on the same day as the victory at Plataea, would see the fight taken into the Persian lands. These battles would see the elimination of the Persian army as a threat in the case of Plataea, while the navy would be destroyed at Mycale, even though the battle would occur on land. Plataea and Mycale would mark a point, with the benefit of hindsight, to the end of the Greek and Persian War, or perhaps, more accurately, the end of the Second Persian Invasion. Though after the Greek victory at these two large decisive battles, there would be no surrender or agreements made at the negotiation table. Events in the region would just continue with the Greeks and Persians acting in accordance with the situation before them. The Greeks were interested in continuing campaigning in 479 to remove the Persian influence in the Eastern Aegean and the Hellespont. The region of Ionia had gone back into revolt with the Persian defeat at Mycale, and with it being so decisive, the Persians were in no position to respond this time around. This would see much of the western regions of Anatolia break away from Persian influence. The Hellenic League would sail their triremes north along the coast into the Hellespont, with Xerxes' bridges connecting Persia to Europe being the target. The Greeks would arrive to discover the bridges had already been broken up, though Persian influence was still present, with the city of Sestos being where the region was administered from. It was at this point that the Peloponnesian element of the fleet, as well as the command element, remembering the Spartans led both the fleet and the army, decided to make back for mainland Greece. The Persian threat had been seen to have been dealt with with further campaigning, where further campaigning was no longer in their interests. This would prove to be a decision with consequences over the next few years. The Spartan leadership of the Hellenic League fleet would be absent while operations would continue. Athens, though, did still have interest in the region, while the security of the Ionian Greeks would be used as an argument for continued operations. The Spartans had seen the best way to protect the Ionians was to relocate them west back into mainland Greece. But again, this was not in the Athenian interests. They had colonies in the region, while the Hellespont was an important trade route for supply of food for their population. The economy of Athens depended on their economic interests in the east. Once again, these competing interests of the two largest members of the Hellenic League would also see events evolve over the next couple of years. With the departure of the Spartans, Athens would take a leading role within the fleet. They would now direct their attention towards Sestos, besieging the city, apparently caught off guard. Once the Greeks had landed in the region, 
the various Persian garrisons had fallen back to Sestos, seeing it as the strongest position. Though, having been caught off guard, the Persian commander had not made the appropriate preparations to withstand a siege. The problem also exacerbated by the extra soldiers seeking shelter. Nevertheless, the Greeks themselves would suffer great hardships during the siege, with the expected quick campaign not eventuating, and instead dragging well into the autumn. Though the Greek commanders were able to keep the discipline of their men, it would be the Persians who would crack, being in a far more precarious position. The Persian command arranged to slip out of the city during the night, seeing that it was no longer possible to maintain order within the city. Once the garrison was aware of the departure of the commanders and their forces, the gates were opened to the Greeks and the city surrendered. Sestos was occupied by the Greeks, while another Greek force went in pursuit of the Persians. One Persian group would disappear when entering hostile Thracian lands, while another group would be forced to turn and fight the Athenians. In the battle, the Persians would be defeated and their commanders taken into captivity, where they would later be executed. This would see the Persian influence in the Chersonese severely reduced with the removal of the Persian garrisons. The campaigning season of 439 BC was also coming to a close, with it moving into the time of year where it was extremely dangerous to keep a fleet at sea. The Athenians, along with the Greeks of Anatolia, remained and wintered in the region before them returning to their cities once weather had returned to more favourable conditions for sailing. This sees us caught back up to where we left the narrative previously, marking the end of the second Persian invasion, as well as departing from Herodotus as a source, and now having Thucydides become our guide. As I outlined earlier, the times being experienced do not stop to recognise these points of demarcation, events just would continue to unfold. Back in Athens, once the Persians had been ejected from the Greek lands after Plataea, the Athenians had crossed back over into Attica, from the refuge they had taken on Salamis, Trozen, and other various cities that had aided them during Mardonius' occupation. The city of Athens had been destroyed a second time in 12 months. After the rebuilding efforts in 480, Mardonius would capture and raise the city once again after Athens refused Persian terms to come over to their side. Though, once again, the Athenians would return to their destroyed city and would begin rebuilding. The traditions and legacy that Athens had built over its generations were too strong for it to disappear from an act of violence. As Themistocles had pointed out to Eurybiades before the Battle of Salamis, Athens was her people. As long as her citizens remained, Athens would always be. Themistocles had disappeared from the pages of history after the victory at Salamis, with it appearing he had been voted out of office that year. Perhaps he had fallen out of favour with the people of Athens when he began relishing in the fame he had acquired after the victory at Salamis. Though, with the reoccupation of Athens, it would seem Themistocles became more politically active once again, with Diodorus and Plutarch suggesting he had been restored to favour during this period. It would appear Themistocles had taken a leading role in the rebuilding taking place at Athens, where we also see much focus placed on the rebuilding of the defensive walls around the city. This would become a main point of contention between Athens and Sparta, and the next major diplomatic exchange between the two cities, since the dealings before Plataea. Themistocles would be presented at the centre of these exchanges with him travelling to Sparta. The Spartans, who seemed more interested in strengthening their influence within mainland Greece rather than the eastern Aegean, were concerned with the desire of other polis to surround their cities with defensive walls. The Thucydides also tells us that the Spartans and their allies had been concerned with the rise and power of Athens during the Persian invasions and in the wake of the Greek victory. Sparta had been recognised as a natural leader during the war but Athens, with their creation of the most powerful navy and important role in defeating the Persian fleet, had seen a rapid growth in her influence, potentially putting up a challenge to Spartan interests in the Greek lands. Now getting wind of the building projects taking place in Athens, the Spartans sent a delegation to address their concerns, though attempting to conceal them at the same time. The delegation tried to convince Athens to refrain from rebuilding their fortifications, and not only that, but they should assist them in reducing the walls of those cities north of the Corinthian Isthmus. The argument put forward by the Spartans for this action was supposedly to be a defensive measure in case of another invasion by the Persians. During 480 and 479, the Persians had been able to maintain a strong base of operations in Thessaly and at Thebes, taking advantage of their defences. If they were able to invade again, the absence of any fortified cities would have it much harder for them to mount offensive operations from Greek lands. Though from how the Athenians would respond, would suggest they saw right through the Spartan arguments. The Athenians appeared to entertain what the Spartan delegation had put forward in an attempt to stall talks and allow enough time for the fortifications around Athens to be rebuilt, before having to commit to an answer. 
they told the Spartans that an Athenian embassy would be arranged to travel to Sparta and discuss matters further. Themistocles proposed that he should be sent to Sparta where he would delay talks. You may remember that after the Battle of Salamis, he had held good favour with the Spartans. He would now engage in a game similar to the Spartans before the Battle of Plataea, where he kept making excuses to not have to meet with the Spartan assembly. Themistocles assured them that he was awaiting the rest of the embassy before discussing matters, though they had been caught up with business back in Athens. His favour could only hold out for so long, the Spartans ended up becoming suspicious of what game Athens was playing. The Spartans ended up sending an envoy to Athens to check the status of the fortifications, where they would discover their true intentions. Themistocles, aware of the Spartan mission, also sent a message back to Athens, asking them to delay the envoy enough for the fortifications to reach a satisfactory standard, so he himself could reveal Athens' intent before the Spartan agents and perhaps allowing Athens some hostages to prevent Sparta acting unfavourably to him once the truth was revealed. Themistocles would end up being able to address the Spartans, informing that Athens had now been fortified. In his address he basically told them that Athens was capable of looking out for her own interests and would look out for what was best for them, and it was best for the alliance that they were engaged in. As Thucydides has Themistocles say, For it was only on the basis of equal strength that equal and fair discussions on the common interests could be held. This turn of events, we are told, frustrated the Spartans greatly, though they would diplomatically hold their tongues. At this stage, relations between the two cities were still on friendly terms in the wake of the victory over Persia. Though, more incidents like these, plus growing Athenian influence, would begin to test these feelings of friendship. The incident also had Sparta rethinking the favour they had held Themistocles in. They would have thought they might have been able to leverage the relationship to help with Spartan interests, though it was clear Themistocles' policies in Athens were at odds with Spartan policy. With Athens now fortified and the reason for talks between the two abolished, the respective delegations returned back to their cities. This period of rebuilding would also see Themistocles' design on the Piraeus being realised. He had identified it as a more suitable port and now was able to finish the construction and also have it fortified. The Piraeus would be able to support a much larger fleet than the previous location. And since the massive shipbuilding program started by Themistocles, he had his eye on this location. If Athens was going to rest its influence on sea power, it needed to ensure it could support a large navy and also protect its infrastructure. Even though the Persians had been defeated in Greece, there was still the threat that they could once again return with another invading force. For this reason, the Hellenic League was still operating and it would mount further actions in the Aegean, challenging Persian influence. The Spartan king, Leotychidas, and the regent Pausanias were still occupying the leadership roles in Sparta and in the Hellenic League, though with the onset of the 478 campaigning season, they would switch roles. Leotychidas would command the army, while Pausanias would take control of the Hellenic fleet. The navy would once again set sail into the Aegean, though the level of resources committed to it this year were not to the extent as the previous two. Thucydides tells us that the Peloponnesians would only send 20 ships, though Diodorus would tell us it was 50, while Athens would send 30, with perhaps the other allies making up the majority of the fleet. We had seen that Sparta was more interested in returning to matters within Greek lands, though they had recognised the importance of maintaining their leadership role within the League. Athens, it would appear, were committing more resources and manpower to the rebuilding activities within Athens. It would seem Themistocles would remain back in Athens overseeing the many projects at hand, while Aristides, along with a new figure to enter the stage of Athenian politics in the historical record, Cimon, would command the Athenian contingent. Next episode we are going to turn to focusing on the political landscape in Athens and what would develop because of it. Themistocles, Aristides, Xanthippus, and especially Cimon, the newcomer to the Athenian political stage, would have a great impact on the direction Athenian policy would take. So here, I want to now shift our main focus to events relating to Sparta, and more specifically, the royal figures of Pausanias and Leotychidas. Athens will be front and centre next episode. Before we continue with events around these two figures, I just want to address the perception often given to politics and policy within Sparta. Often the perception is given that the Spartan policy was monolithic in nature, with the entire society agreeing and following through on. This view has developed mostly due to all of our sources coming from non-Spartan writers and representing policy as just Spartan without distinguishing the different factions within. Though, in reality, the picture within Sparta was more complex 
with debate over policy taking place, and not to mention the rivalries that developed, simply due to the two family lines of the royal houses. We do get hints that policy was debated over, through some of the stories Herodotus presents, but we don't get the level of detail as we do with the political inner workings of Athens. Sparta was not too dissimilar to other Greek city-states with its multiple levels of government, which would have seen much debate over their policy, before it would be developed for the wider Greek world to witness. As we continue on, we will get a little more insight into this aspect, especially through two proposed factions by some modern historians that would develop heading into the Peloponnesian War, the War Party and the Peace Party. Another thing to keep in mind also is that the period we are now moving into, often referred to as the Pentecontatia, lacks much insight into Spartan internal politics, with much of what we know coming from the context around Athenian events and actions. The Pentecontatia refers to the roughly 50 year period between the end of the Greco Persian Wars to the breakout of the Peloponnesian War. So back to the events in the Aegean. The Hellenic League fleet would now sail out into the Aegean first making its way to Cyprus. Here there were still a number of Persian garrisons on the island. We get no detail of the Greek adventures other than that they were able to extinguish almost all Persian influence. One can imagine that it was perhaps not as strong as it used to be with the Greeks' campaigns in the Eastern Aegean the previous year. Clearing Persian influence from the island would have been important to ensuring open trade routes. As we have seen in the past, Cyprus was an important trading hub connecting the East and West. Also, the various cities of Cyprus would have been a good source of ships that could have supplied the Persian navy. Once Cyprus had been secured, the Greek fleet then moved on northward and back through to the Hellespont, with Byzantium as their target. Byzantium was also under Persian control, though the Greek force under the command of Pausanias was able to secure the surrender of the city. These victories of such key positions perhaps really highlight the extent that Persian influence and control had evaporated in the western parts of the empire from 479 BC. It was in this campaign, and especially after the capture of Byzantium, that Spartan leadership would begin to be resented. Perhaps this came down to the character of the different Spartan kings and commanders. As we saw, Eurybiades and Leotychidas were able to hold together the Hellenic League, though with great difficulty, in the fleet during 480 and 479. Though now with Pausanias in command, it appears he had a different approach to the difficulties of maintaining the various contingents in the fleet. Pausanias took a heavier handed approach, especially towards the Eastern Greeks, such as the Ionians. This is perhaps where the actions of Leotychidas in 479, when he left the campaign around the Hellespont to head home, are revealed to have been a miscalculation on Sparta's part when it came to their monopoly on leadership. This had allowed the Athenians to take command and show that they were also very capable leaders and able to maintain the alliance, providing an alternative in the minds of other League members. Sparta would end up recalling Pausanias, perhaps concerned with the way Sparta was being represented within the League. We even hear through Diodorus that Mattis had got into a stage where some of the Peloponnesians had even deserted and reported what was happening across the Aegean once arriving back home. If this was the case, this would have really concerned the Spartans. Though it would seem there might have been other activities that he was involved in that Sparta was also concerned with feeding into the fear of their leaders becoming corrupted when away from the Peloponnese that comes through in the sources. Have you been enjoying the series and want to show your support in some way? You can visit www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button. Here you will find many ways you can help the series grow, from subscribing, getting involved in social media, and leaving reviews where you listen to your podcasts. Other options also include assisting with my Amazon wishlist for resources and supporting the series on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. The support I have been receiving so far has been fantastic. So a big thank you to everyone who has been helping me grow the series. The various members of the Hellenic League would observe Pausanias' behaviour, seeing that he was beginning to act more like a dictator rather than a commander of a coalition. Reports were filtering out that Pausanias was starting to close off access to himself. This was presented in that he would get around in Median dress, while also having a Persian bodyguard. To the Greeks, these were quintessential symbols of corruption and decadence. This would see accusations that he was collaborating with the Persians and accepting gold. Both Thucydides and Diodorus write that Pausanias acted in this way after having made contact with Xerxes, apparently even looking to betray the Greeks to the Persians in return for rule over the mainland. 
We are even told that sometime after the Battle of Plataea, and when the Serpent Column had been constructed, to celebrate the victory, Pausanias' own perceived worth was transferred onto this monument that was to be dedicated to the gods. He would have inscribed on it, The Mede defeated, great Pausanias raised this monument, the Phoebus might be praised. This would see Pausanias recognise himself as victor over the Persian invasions, and almost tantamount to hubris. For the Greeks, just this action could explain the following years leading to his downfall. Eventually, Pausanias' inscription would be scrubbed, and the names of the 31 cities responsible for the defence of Greece would be inscribed on the column. We hear the initial corruption began after Byzantium had been taken, where a number of high-ranking officials and relatives of Xerxes were taken prisoner. Pausanias is supposed to have arranged for the prisoners to have been reunited with Xerxes, but it made to look to the Greeks like they had escaped. It was seen with this act he was not only chasing Persian gold but favour with Xerxes, as Thucydides records letters that were apparently exchanged between the two. Pausanias, the commander-in-chief of Sparta, wishing to do you a favour, sends you these men, who he has taken prisoner in war. And I propose also, if you agree, to marry your daughter, and bring both Sparta and the rest of Hellas under your control. I consider that, if we make our plans together, I am quite able to achieve this. If you therefore are attracted by this idea, send down the coast a reliable person, through who we may in future communicate with each other. The man sent to make contact with Pausanias and deliver Xerxes' response was Artabazus, who on his arrival in the region made sure the letter made its way to Byzantium. These are the words of King Xerxes to Pausanias. Your act in saving the men whom you have sent me across from the Sea of Byzantium will be laid upon you in gratitude, recorded for everyone in our house. With the words also which you sent to me, I am pleased. Let neither night or day keep you idle in the performance of your promises to me, nor let them be hindered for want of gold or silver to spend, nor numbers of troops, should they be needed anywhere. I have sent a good man, Artabazus. With him, go forward confidently and advance your interests and mine in the way that will be best and most successful for us both. Back in Sparta, Pausanias would answer for all these accusations, though he would be cleared of all charges on lack of any tangible evidence. Though, concerned with appeasing the members of the Hellenic League, or that he was being corrupted with his absence from Sparta, they decided not to send him back to take up the position of command. Instead, they would send back to the fleet a Spartan named Dorsus, to take up command. However, at this stage the Athenians had taken up the leadership role, with the drama around Pausanias unfolding. This had been encouraged by the other members of the League, especially those cities in Anatolia. This made much sense even outside the concerns around Pausanias, since the Ionians and Athenian interests were aligned in this region. The Spartans, seeing the fleet was no longer in the mood to have another Spartan commander, turned around and returned back to the Peloponnese. The sources here indicate that Sparta accepted this turn of events, with no opposition offered. We are told that the Spartans were glad to be out of the Aegean, as they had no interest in being burdened with operations against Persia, while on the back of their minds was the threat of corruption to their leaders when away from Sparta for extended periods. This would now see Athens officially take over command of the fleet, even though they had been running operations on and off since 479, though Sparta would no longer be involved in the fleet. This would see the beginnings of a new alliance and a league that would come to be known as the Delian League. Its formation would also be another event that as developments unfolded would lead to great tensions. Though the subject of the Delian League and its beginnings will be the focus of our next episode. For now, I want to stick with Pausanias and the downfall that would continue. It's also important to note here we will be following events with Pausanias that would continue up until around 471 BC. But don't worry, we'll be going back to cover the other matters during this period, such as the Delian League, and focus on the political landscape in Athens in the following episodes. I just want to follow the thread of the Spartan royal figures in this episode. When Pausanias was cleared of his charges, he would once again make his way back to Byzantium, though this time not on the orders of the Spartans. It would appear he had returned for his own personal reasons and to stay in contact with Xerxes. He had not returned to attempt to take back up command of the Hellenic League, but had told the Greeks he had returned to assist in the cause. We hear he would engage in much the same extravagant behaviour as before, though the rest of the League were unconvinced of his reported motives for returning. Pisonius would be chased out of Byzantium and would attempt to settle near the Hellespont at a city called Coloni. Word had made it back to Sparta of Pausanias' return and actions back over in Anatolia. The ephors, on hearing his settling at Coloni, sent a herald to deliver a message to him. It's probably worth pointing out here that not all in Sparta thought Pausanias to be innocent of all the charges. The nature of the political landscape back in Sparta probably saw him get off his charges in the first place. 
The dynamics between the different factions within Sparta would see Spartan actions and decisions change. These actions that we saw occur in the sources are probably our best evidence that there were opposing political views with different factions forming around them. We don't get the accounts of their inner political workings like we do with Athens, we just get what seems to be the end result, in the form of their actions from what had taken place from their internal political manoeuvrings. The message that Pisanias had been delivered had ordered him to accompany the herald back to Sparta to address the charges against him, or else be declared a public enemy. Pausanias complied with the orders, according to Thucydides, thinking he could bribe himself out of suspicion. Though on his return, it appears there was enough suspicion of his actions, and more importantly enough, of a change in the political landscape in Sparta, to see Pausanias put behind bars. He really only now had one option left open to him, and that was allow himself to be put on trial, and an inquiry to be conducted into his actions. His thinking here would have probably been that he still had a chance with his supporters' assistance to see him shake these charges. We hear that based on the current evidence that the Spartans had, they were unwilling to condemn a king, or in Pisanias' case a regent representing the kingship of the underage Blastarchus. All the evidence that had been gathered to this point were from non-Spartan sources, but unfortunately for Pisanias, this thread of evidence would continue to develop, seeing Spartan suspicion increase to where they would actively seek proof heard by their own ears. Accusations had also emerged that he had been intriguing with the helots to help in his designs outlined to Xerxes. Supposedly they would be granted their freedom. Even with the Spartan paranoia with the helots, this was still not enough to act on. It was still hearsay, though finally more tangible evidence would emerge that would appear to break the camel's back and see the Spartans actively seek a confession from Pausanias. It seems Pausanias had kept up communications over the years with the Xerxes despite the growing suspicion, which would eventually be discovered. I'll relate what Thucydides reports in regards to this discovery. At last, it is said, the person who was going to carry to Artabazus the last letter for the king, a man named Argalus, once the favourite and most trusted servant of Pausanias, turned informer, alarmed by the reflection that none of the previous messengers had ever returned, having counterfeited the seal in order that, if he found himself mistaken in his surmises, or if Pausanias should ask to make some correction, he might not be discovered. He undid the letter and found the postscript that he had suspected, namely, an order to put him to death. Armed with this more tangible evidence, the e suspicion had grown to new heights, and the influence within Spartan politics was shifting away from where Pausanias' interests lay. They would now seek to press the matter further and seek a confession for their own ears. To get the information they sought, the ephors devised a scheme with the would-be messenger. They arranged for him to attend the Temple of Poseidon in Sparta as a suppliant. He had set himself up in a hut that had a partition dividing it, and where a number of ephors could conceal themselves. Pausanias came to meet his long-term friend at the temple and addressed the concerns he had. The man wanted to know why Pausanias had arranged for this fate for him, even though he had served him faithfully in the past. In addressing his complaints, Pausanias revealed the plans that had been contained in the letter, implicating himself in the plot as the ephors listened on. Though Pausanias would attempt to keep the plan in motion, guaranteeing the security and welfare of his friend and messenger, insisting he should continue on negotiations with Persia on his behalf. This had now finally satisfied the ephors suspicion, and they now planned to place Pausanias under arrest after leaving the temple. Though, as they approached Pausanias on the street, Either he became suspicious of what was about to transpire, or he had been tipped off by a supporter amongst the ephors. He then fled to a nearby temple, where he took shelter in a small room, evading the ephors in the short term. Eventually though, his location was discovered, and Thucydides reports that the ephors removed the roof of where he was hiding, while also walling up the exits. They then had guards posted outside, so that there was no escape, and left him to exposure and starvation. Diodorus adds a little more to this story by saying that the ephors were originally unsure of how to proceed when discovering Pausanias' location, but his mother would attend the temple where she would lay a brick at the entrance, showing her attitude towards their son's crimes, to where the ephors would follow her example. When Pausanias was on the point of expiring, he was removed from the temple so as not to pollute the area. Once out in the open, the victor of Plataea, now seen as a traitor by his own people, would die. Discussions had taken place to decide what to do with his body, with some seeing him as nothing more than a criminal and should be treated accordingly, though he would eventually be given a proper burial within Sparta. Pausanias was not the only ruling Spartan figure 
to see his downfall after the victory of the Persian invasions. The Spartan king, Leotychidas, who had overseen the victory at Mycale in 479, would also find himself charged with corruption. For Herodotus, Leotychidas' downfall would be seen as inevitable due to his actions when he first came to the throne. As you may remember, he had been implicated in the conspiracy with Cleomenes to have the Spartan king Demaratus deposed in 491, where Leotychidas would become the new king. Because of the disrespect shown to the divine in this episode, the fate of both would be seen to have been sealed. As stated at the beginning of the episode, Leotychidas had swapped his naval command for the command of the land forces. The next action that we would hear about the land forces being involved in was campaigning in Thessaly. We had seen Pisanius had led forces against Thebes right after the victory at Plataea, where he would punish them for medizing and remove the faction in power. A few years later, Leotychidas would enter into Thessaly, where it seems a similar campaign was conducted, and perhaps an effort to spread Spartan influence. It's not known for sure when this campaign occurred, but most modern historians place it around 476 BC. As you may recall, Thessaly had gone over to the Persians as the second Persian invasion of 480 was developing. We also saw they were left with very little choice after the Hellenic League had abandoned their defensive position at Tempe, near Mount Olympus. Nevertheless, Leotychidas would be victorious in his engagements in Thessaly, though it would fall short of controlling the entire region due to being bribed by the ruling family. Herodotus would say that he was caught red-handed right in the camp sitting on a glove full of silver. We get nothing like the detail we do with the episode around Pausanias that's found in Thucydides and Diodorus' account, but we hear that Leotychidas would be put on trial, have his house burnt, and would end up going into exile and to Gia. Exactly when this occurred is hard to tell, with it appearing he possibly still remained king in exile until his death in 469, where then his grandson Archidamus would succeed him. So, one must ask, what led two Spartan royal figures who had been so heavily involved in the defence of Greece to so quickly fall from grace? When it comes to Pausanias, we get somewhat of a contrast of what is presented in Herodotus' account during the Greco-Persian Wars as to how he was presented in Thucydides' account. Herodotus presents him as cool, calm and collected when under fire. He shows him as humble when victorious and not swayed by the decadent Persian way of life. Though when we meet him again, Thucydides has him as dictatorial, cruel and arrogant, while he also shows him being tempted by Persian money and power for himself. Not only this, but he is seen to embrace the ways of the Persian court life, engaging in the decadence he once mocked on the fields of Plataea. Knowing what led to this transformation, we are probably not going to know for certain, since no Spartan accounts of the period, let alone of any period, survive to this day. Though perhaps we can surmise based on how the other sources present events, along with how the Spartans in general are written about. Certainly, after this period, we are told that Sparta returned to looking towards the Greek mainland rather than regions further afield, as they were afraid of their leaders becoming corrupted. Though even the picture we see coming to us around events before and during the Greek and Persian Wars also showed the Spartan reluctance to travel too far from home. Often this has been associated with the large helot population and the threat of a revolt that existed. Sending the best part of their forces on a far-flung campaign would not have been an attractive proposition. Though decisions on policy very rarely rest on one consideration, they are usually more complex. Perhaps a lack of sources helps us look towards single-faceted reasons. Though when we look back, we see that Leotychidas and Pausanias were not the only corruptible Spartans. We saw before the Ionian revolt Aristagoras' attempt to corrupt Cleomenes, with a bribe to come to the Ionian's aid militarily. We then see it was his daughter, Gorgo, who would act as his conscience, as it seemed he was entertaining the idea. She would say to her father, This foreigner will be the ruin of you, unless you get to your feet and leave. This exchange that takes place in Herodotus' account is interesting as it seems to point out the danger of outside influences being corrupting of Spartan society. Aristagoras attempts to have Gorgo sent away so he might be able to convince Cleomenes alone. This seems to represent the notion that once you remove Sparta from the Spartan, they are much more prone to corruption. Another royal figure where I see corruption taking hold is with the deposed king Demaratus. Even though he would be the victim of a conspiracy led by Cleomenes, Though, once he was deposed, he would have no qualms in finding his way to the Persian court, 
and taking rewards for his service against Sparta and Greece during the invasion. One would think from all the ideas that exist to Spartan virtues, this would be far from becoming behaviour of a Spartiote and a royal one at that. It would seem, while a direct threat against Greece existed, it was much easier for a society and its leadership to find a common cause and unite in defeating it. This, as we saw, was also extended to the wider Greek world outside Sparta with the creation of the Hellenic League. The conflict would be centred on the Greek homeland, where they would be in close contact with their cities and societies. Though once Persia had been defeated in Greek lands, the conflict turned to regions further afield, taking them away from their societies, and along with that, the customs and the laws that govern their normal city life. The longer this disconnection occurred and exposure to different ideas and customs, the more abstract their old way of life seemed, while what they were actually being exposed to and experienced would become more attractive. Though, having said this, this was not something unique to Sparta, but it would rather have seemed to be a concept that affects the human condition in general. As well as this, the individual character of a man would also play a large role in how he dealt with these changing conditions. Anyway, these are just some of the parting thoughts on what saw this potential transition of the two celebrated Spartan commanders. As I said, we can't know for sure what led to these changes, but that shouldn't stop us from exploring potential ideas around it. So in this episode, I have built a little context to the year after the victory at Plataea and Makale, with events taking place. I then decided to focus on the thread of Sparta and the unfolding events around Pausanias and Leotychidas, which saw us follow their downfalls up until around 471 BC. By next episode, we will be turning back to 478, where we will focus more in on Athens' political developments and the birth of what would become to be known as the Delian League. As you will see through this period, following some threads to their conclusion may be helpful, but don't worry, I will be going back to cover the events we did skip over. Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. I would also like to give a personal shout out to Dale Hempstead, who recently signed up as a supporter on Patreon. I greatly appreciate your decision to do so. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series, and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece, or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time for episode 52, Birth of the Delian League.